Welcome boys and girls. We're flipping that flip class some more and today we're going to be talking about chemical reactions. We're starting a metabolism unit and so we need to understand a little bit more about how uh, chemical reactions work and how the chemistry of energy happens inside your cells before we can really dive in deep for cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So here we go. Metabolism generally, you know this already, is the sum of all the chemical reactions in your body. It's just basically, you know, what's happening. But we can break that down into two separate uh, versions. There's anabolism, which is the building of molecules, and there's also uh, going to be catabolism, which is the opposite. Catabolism would be the breaking down of molecules. The way that I remember it is that cats break things. Now, while anabolism is going to require energy to be put in for the building, catabolism, being the opposite, is actually going to release energy from the equation. So you're breaking these bonds and that releases energy into the environment. And using these two different halves of your metabolism, your body is able to, you know, run and you're able to not die. And together, the anabolism and all the catabolism, so essentially all the building of the molecules and all the breaking of the molecules, that is your entire metabolism. A little bit of chemistry review in case you need it. If not, just skip through the next like five to 10 seconds. Well, maybe more like 20 seconds. You have a chemical equation written up here. This side over here are the reactants. This is the chemical equation for photosynthesis. You do need to have this memorized. So might as well get it in there now. So you have carbon dioxide, water, and energy are put in. Water and carbon dioxide definitely always need to be put up there. Energy isn't necessarily always written on the reactant side, just this way you know that this is a uh, anabolism reaction. We're putting energy in. We're building glucose and oxygen. And those two over there are the products. So you can see that uh, the reactants yield the products. That's the way that you would read this chemical uh, equation. So let's talk about uh, reactions just a little bit more. For the most part, any chemical change, right? You think of those chemical properties. Any chemical change is going to take a chemical reaction. Don't think about it as, a change that can't be undone anymore, because you can't undo it. You just need more chemistry for that to happen. So it's a change that requires some kind of chemical reaction. The process, when one or more substances change into another substance, that is essentially different ways to think about it. What's important though is it requires chemical bonds to be either broken or formed. A lot of times it's both. You're breaking bonds and forming bonds, but overall are more bonds being broken or are more bonds being formed? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And the reason is because anytime you have, say, a bond between carbon and carbon, if you were to break that bond, pow, you would be releasing energy. You've got your uh, carbons and they're not bonded together and you wanted to input energy, that would take energy to be able to make your bond. So these are the two sides of each coin. So you can see here that catabolism is breaking more bonds to release the energy, whereas anabolism is taking energy out of the environment and using it to form these nice bonds between the two carbons. So let's talk about activation energy is another term that you need to know. This is the energy that's required to start chemical reactions. You may have noticed that there's things around you in the air right now, like there's CO2 and there's water in the air right now, but it's not just turning into sugar and oxygen on its own. These two things will react together, but you have to make sure that you get the activation energy for that to happen. That's the energy required for any reaction to start. Even those where energy is gained, there's an overall net gain of energy that is still going to require some activation energy. Now here's where it gets tricky. Now don't like out on me just because all of a sudden there's a graph. But you guys can do this. So we're looking at a function of time. They're calling it reaction progress. But really, it's time down here. There, now it even says time. You look at the amount of energy, you can see that the, your reactants are just hanging out over here. Here they are, diamonds, not doing, you know, whatever. 
but at some point you actually reach the energy required to start. This point here, that highest bit, that is called the activation energy. This is where the complex has been activated and our reaction is now happening. As a result, you can see that this reaction, giving you a graphite, is actually releasing energy to the environment. This would be an example of breaking bonds. Diamonds and graphite are both pure carbon. Diamonds have a lot more bonds than carbon, therefore they're holding a lot more energy as you can see on the graph. And because the graphite down here, having fewer bonds, is also in a lower energy state, you can see the energy was released out into the environment. So this would be an example of a catabolic reaction. It's catabolism. It's breaking more bonds than were formed, so we're releasing energy to the environment. Another way to think about activation energy would be if here's, you know, me with my longer hair, and I want this rock to roll down the hill. It'll do it on its own, but at first I have to get it to the top of the hill for it to happen. So you see here, here's point A. Here's point B, where the rock is in a lower energy state because it is, you know, farther down. Think about, you know, your potential energy due to gravity. So here's two reactions, and you need to see that there's a difference in these two reactions. In the one on the left, you're starting with your reactants, and then you have your products that are down here at a lower energy level. Same thing over here, the one on the right, you're starting with your reactants here. You go up here and you see that your products are at a higher energy level. And both times you had to go way above it in order to activate the complex. You had to reach the activation energy for the reaction to happen. But you see that these are our two reactions that are of different types of metabolism. Here we're releasing energy, so that's catabolism. Over here, we're storing energy in the product. See, it's a higher, so here's the energy before. And now we have more energy in the products. So we're storing that energy in the form of bonds. This is an anabolism reaction. Now you can also think of these in terms of heat. These reactions in the freshman class we called exothermic. Now we have a different word, we're going to call them exergonic. Because they're releasing energy to the environment. Same thing over here, we used to call these reactions in the freshman science endothermic, inner heat. Now we call them endergonic. Ender being still inside, gonic referring to the amount of energy, and the energy is stored inside the product now. It's been taken out of the environment, and it's now stored inside the product. All right, and essentially here is all those words that I just said with words to back them up. Again, the exergonic reactions, those are ones that are releasing energy, so they're breaking bonds. A good example would be our decomposers in the food web. They're going to break things down, releasing a lot of heat. One of the reasons why a compost pile and rotting food are both a little warmer, which is gross. And then you have your reactions that are taking the energy away from the environment. Those would be our endergonic reactions. Energy could be on either side, but remember, it's going to be more on the side uh, with the reactants because we're storing that energy, we're building things, synthesis reactions like, I don't know, photosynthesis? So, here's the question. We've got energy over here on the reactant side. What type of reaction is this? What type of metabolism is it? You can tell quite clearly that we're building things because it has the word synthesis. So therefore must be anabolism. And because we're putting energy into system, not getting it out, putting it into system, since this would be endergonic, insert Ender's game reference Yeah. One more concept to throw at your faces before we're done is catalyzing reactions. You've noticed that it takes a lot of energy for these reactions to happen. That activation energy is way up high. What catalyzing does is actually lowers the activation energy, allowing the reactions to happen more readily in different temperatures. Some enzymes will actually lower the activation energy all the way down to a point that's even below the available energy in the system. Essentially, a lot of biologists think about enzymes as making reactions happen.
But what's really cool is what an enzyme does, what a catalyst does, it actually allows reactions to happen much faster, and it also will require less energy overall because you don't have to build up to that activation energy. I mean, this is like magic here, people. Imagine you're a factory owner and you find a way to build your product faster and also use less energy. It would be the best. I want that. The object that catalyzes the reaction is or magnetically called a catalyst. Usually in your body it is an enzyme. Sometimes it will be called a ribozyme because it's made out of RNA, which is our single-stranded nucleic acid. That can fold up into different shapes the same way that a protein could. For the most part, the overwhelming majority of the enzymes in your bodies are proteins made by your ribosomes. So keep thinking about your cell organelles, cellular processes still in play. But the best part is the catalyst remains unchanged to do it over and over and over again. Once you're out of reactants, you can't make any more products, but the enzyme remains unchanged. All you need is one enzyme, and it can catalyze thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of different reactants, turning into different products. And it's awesome. The catalyst stays even though the reaction is happening, which is really great. So if you had tons and tons of enzymes, you'd actually make all the reactants turn into all the products all the time. Here's a graphical representation of those things that I just said. You can see here you've got your enzyme. There it is. It's holding your reactants in a certain way so that they will turn into the products. And as you can see on the graph, the red line here with the higher activation energy is representing an uncatalyzed reaction, whereas the blue line is showing you what it would be like with an enzyme. You can see that the activation energy with the enzyme is much smaller than the activation energy without the enzyme. It's worth noting though that in both reactions you're ending up with the exact same products. You started with the exact same reactants, with the exact same energy. The reactants and the products don't change at all. What's different when you catalyze a reaction is your activation energy. And that makes a world of difference, guys. If you did not have enzymes catalyzing the reactions that happen in your body, you would be dead because you would not have enough energy to make those reactions happen. So, because, you know, we're talking about chemistry things, if you wanted to write that a reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme, you actually wouldn't change very much at all. We're actually going to look at a really cool reaction in the lab where we just take hydrogen peroxide which is poisonous, and we're going to turn it into harmless water and oxygen. For the chemistry students in the room, if you want a little extra practice balancing equations, there you go, have at it. You probably noticed that hydrogen peroxide while sitting in the bottle isn't just turning into delicious water and oxygen. You should not drink this stuff, it is a poison. But you have this enzyme in your body that catalyzes the reaction, it is called catalase. So you just write the word catalase right on the line. That signifies that this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme catalase. So again, here's how the enzyme really does what the enzyme does. It actually holds the reactants in position. So they remember, all these things are floating around. In order for a chemical reaction to happen, the business end of one reactant has to bump up against the action end of another reactant. And they're not always facing each other that way. What the enzyme does is holds them in position so they have no choice but to react. As a result, it actually lowers the amount of energy available in the system because the molecules won't have to bump into each other as many times before they randomly hit. As a result, you get more efficient reactions. Yay! Here is a graphic showing just that. You have your enzyme. It holds the reactants, which we will now call the substrate, or substrates if it gets two of them. It holds them in the active site, which is the area of the enzyme that's designed for getting the substrates. Pulls them into the active site and turns it into the product. You'll notice that the reactants were used up, the product is now there, but the enzyme is exactly the same. Here is uh, another picture showing you that same thing. You've got your reactants, they're floating around, right around in this time of having energy. They're into the business zone, they're in their transitional state where they can actually complete the chemical reaction. Enzymes allow that to happen 
much, much easier. Here's all the terminology that you're going to need about enzymes. You'll notice that uh, these are all words that I've been using freely throughout the lecture, so here's a little bit of context in case you weren't able to pick out all the words. You could go back and rewatch the lecture again with further understanding. It's called close reading, but now it'd be close watching. And if you really want, there's a funny animation, just click down here in this area and it will take you to the YouTube video where you can learn about Milo, the enzyme. Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to moodly doodle doodly doodle. Links in the description.